Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. Join me in prayer. Father, we come before you with humble hearts, thankful to have your word wash over us and sanctify us. We recognize there's no greater way for us to become like your son than through your word. I think about Jesus' words, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so, Father, we pray for that sanctifying work, and I pray for understanding. I feel like there's considerably more teaching in this sermon than application as we talk about Jesus' second coming, but these are the verses that we've reached. Help me to rightly divide them. There, uh, we understand that there are many positions or views of the end times, and so I, w- I would pray, Lord, not to hold to any agenda or any position, but simply to hold to your word, and so help us to do that. I pray these verses would become clear. I pray that we would take the plain and simple reading of them. And more than anything, Lord, I pray you would give us hearts that long for Christ's second coming, that blessed hope. Give us anticipation to to see Jesus return. Help us to live in light of that reality. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. All right, good to see all of you. The title of this morning's sermon is The Second Coming of Christ Will Be. The Second Coming of Christ Will Be. So on Sunday mornings, we're working our way through Luke's gospel, verse by verse, and we find ourselves at Luke 17, 22. So contrast allows things to stand out. For example, when the moon is out during the day, you can't see it as well. Sometimes my kids are surprised, and they draw my attention to the fact that they can see the moon during the day and how surprised they are by that, but we can't see it very well because it is close to the color of the sky. But we can see the moon very well at night because its white and gray color stands out so sharply against the black night sky. Well, similarly, what stands out incredibly well against the night sky? Any guesses from the verses? Lightning stands out incredibly well against the the night sky because of its bright white color against that black background. And this morning, we're going to see why Jesus chose lightning as a metaphor for his second coming. So look with me at verse 22. And he said to the disciples, the days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And when it says one of the days of the Son of Man, that just means one of the days that Jesus is on the earth. And so he's going to be gone from the disciples in the near future, something that it seems no matter how many times he told them, that he was going to depart from them, they never seemed to understand that reality. There's at least three recorded instances in the Gospels of Jesus talking about about his death, about his resurrection, but they would not believe him. And so he's telling them that they're going to long to see him, but they would not be able to because they would not be alive when he returned. That's what he's saying. If you look at the end of the verse, he says, you'll long for my day, but you will not see it. And that's because they would not be alive when he returned. He hasn't even returned yet in our day. I would say that the desire the disciples have to see Christ is the same desire that we should have. There are many verses in the New Testament that discuss the desire we should have as believers to see Christ return. Here's just a few of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Titus 2, 13, waiting for our blessed hope. One of the more well-known titles for Jesus' second coming. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jude 20, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads us to eternal life. It seems that the common greeting among Christians in the first century was Maranatha. They would say that to each other. It's an Aramaic word that means the Lord is coming or come, O Lord. So they would greet each other that way. Now, in the following verses, Jesus helps his disciples, both in his day and including us in our day, recognize his second coming. Look with me at verse 23. He says there's going to be people who will say, look there or look here, do not go out or follow them. So there were going to be people claiming that Jesus had returned. He had developed this incredible following. And so following his departure, there were individuals who would be false teachers or false prophets wanting to draw some attention to themselves, claiming that Jesus had returned, telling people, look here or look there. And Jesus didn't want any of his disciples misled into thinking that he had returned in some secret or mysterious way that only these false teachers knew about. 
And so that's really his point here, that he's building the disciples up to the reality that nobody will be misled about his second coming because everyone's going to be able to see it. Nobody is going to be able to say to others, look here or look there, as though the person saying that saw Jesus return, but other people didn't, because the truth is when he returns, everyone is going to see it. There will be no mistaking it as he explains in the following verse. Look at verse 24. He says, for or because as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, this is a repeated phrase, so will the Son of Man be in his day. And so Jesus uses lightning flashing up across the sky, lighting up the sky, he says, from one side to the other to illustrate what the Son of Man's coming will be like or what the second coming will be like. And there's three reasons it's very fitting to compare Jesus' second coming with lightning, and this brings us to lesson one. Lesson one, like lightning, the second coming of Christ will be part one visible. Like lightning, the second coming of Christ will be part one visible. The disciples will not need anyone saying, look here or look there for Jesus' second coming because it's going to be as visible as lightning that lights up and flashes across the whole sky. Jesus even says from one side of the sky to the other. Listen to the way the Amplified words verse 20. The Amplified is a, is a version of the Bible that just adds words to amplify or explain some of the Greek words in the New Testament or Hebrew words in the Old Testament. A little better and in luke 17 24 in the amplified it says just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky gives light to the other part of the sky so visible or that visible will the son of man be in his day and so there will be no mistaking when jesus returns it'll be universally visible go to marker spots in luke and then turn with me to acts one marker spot in luke we'll return to it and then turn to acts one We're going to start at verse 6 for context. So the, con the context, we'll start at verse 6 for context, but even the context for verse 6 is Jesus is approaching his ascension. He's resurrected, been witnessed by hundreds of, of witnesses. The resurrected Christ has had hundreds of witnesses at this point. It, he has had those 40 days following his resurrection, moments away from ascending is the context for this in verse 6 so when they had come together they asked him these are the disciples and they said lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to israel and so interestingly one of, one of the things that i hope can be an encouragement to you when you're ever confused by god's word don't be too discouraged by that because these individuals had spent three and a half years with jesus and were still confused about a great many things and this is one example because despite everything Jesus had taught, there were two things the disciples still did not seem to understand that led to this question. First, they didn't understand Jesus would leave them. We talked about that a moment ago, that he had been preparing them for that. And then the moment that he's about to depart from them or ascend, they still expect him to remain on the earth and establish his kingdom. And then second, in our last sermon, I told you that Jesus spiritually established his kingdom in his first coming, he was going to physically establish his kingdom at his second coming, but the disciples thought he was going to physically establish that kingdom now. So look how he responds. Verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now I will say this. The disciples were confused about a few things, but one thing that they were not confused about was that jesus was going to physically establish a kingdom on the earth so if you because these sermons through these verses will build on each other and so if you remember from last sunday's sermon jesus spiritually established the kingdom on his earth in his first coming he would return to physically establish the kingdom on his earth in his in his second coming and one thing the disciples were not confused about was that jesus was going to physically establish his kingdom on the earth and so notice jesus did not correct that john macarthur wrote this mirrored this idea that jesus would establish a physical kingdom on the earth mirrored what jesus had taught and what the old testament predicted otherwise jesus would have corrected them about such a crucial aspect of his teaching 
So Jesus tells them that they don't need to be worried about the timing of his second coming. Instead, they just need to worry about remaining faithful until that time. Look at verse 8. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit's going to descend at Pentecost. Acts 1 is the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of the Father, where at the right hand of the Father, he then sends out the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. So Acts 1 is the ascension of Jesus. Acts 2 is the descension of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost upon all of those disciples present to empower them to then spread the gospel through Judea, Samaria, finally the ends of the earth. Still the mission today is we preach the gospel and send missionaries around the globe. Then notice what happens, which would have been a complete shock to them, Verse the disciples who were present. Verse 9, when he had said these things, as the disciples were looking on, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. More than likely, this is the glory cloud or Shekinah that represented God's presence that we see throughout the Old Testament, the cloud that went with the Israelites when they traveled through the wilderness, the same cloud that spoke to God or spoke to Mo that God used to speak to Moses. So to make it simple, when it says this cloud took Jesus out of their sight, more than likely this is imagery for God the Father, who doesn't have a body, but his spirit receiving his son into heaven. So now look what happens. Verse 10, while the disciples were gazing into heaven as Jesus went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and more than likely these men are angels. And it seems like these angels, if they hadn't shown up, how long would the disciples have stood there? <laughs> it doesn't seem like they're going anywhere. Who knows how long they would have remained looking up to heaven, waiting for Jesus' return. So these angels show up and they speak to them in verse 11. And then this is the important verse for this morning. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, and then notice this, he will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So one more time, the second sentence in verse 11, Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, how did Jesus ascend to heaven? What are words that come to mind? Visibly, physically, bodily. And for him to return the exact same way that he ascended is to say that he will return visibly, physically, bodily, not spiritually. And now I'll pause and explain something. This brings us to lesson two. We will come back to lesson one. Lesson two, preterists believe the future is in the past. Preterists believe the future is in the past. Lesson two. Sorry for throwing off the sound, guys. I should have told you guys we'd be jumping to lesson two first. Can we do that? Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Next time I'll let you know when, I, when we don't go in, go in order like that. My mistake. So, preterism is based on the Latin word preter, which simply means past. And so, when you think about preterism, you're talking about a belief that future things or end times have occurred in the past. It's the eschatological or prophetic view that the end times were largely fulfilled in 70 AD when Rome attacked Jerusalem. Now, this is a super important point about preterism. Preterists generally fall into two groups, one that I would consider to be orthodox and one orth unorthodox. The orthodox group of preterists would be known as partial preterists. And like the name implies, they partially believe that the end times were fulfilled in 70 AD. Or they partially believe that many things in the book of Revelation or in the Olivet Discourse, which are the, the main uh, end times sections of scripture, occurred in 70 AD. So let's talk about partial preterists. They would believe much of the book of Revelation or perhaps even most of it, but not all of it, and the Olivet Discourse. So we'd be thinking of the rapture, tribulation, the Antichrist, the mark of the beast were already fulfilled. But the important thing for partial preterists is they're still looking forward to the second coming of Christ to physically establish his kingdom on the earth. So well-known or respected partial preterists would be R.C. Sproul, Kenneth Gentry, Gary DeMar, and Hank Hanegraaff, the, the Bible answer man, who seems... Hank seems to have kind of went off the deep end. I don't know a better way to say it. So I'm not even sure if he'd still be considered 
a partial preterist. In terms of denominations, the Orthodox Presbyterians, or OPC, the Presbyterian Church of America, and P or PCA are generally partial preterists. Now, full preterists, or full preterism, teaches that all future events, such as Jesus' second coming, the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, are all in the past. Every single thing we look at as, look at as future, they see as past, generally fulfilled in 70 AD. And, in, and when I say 70 AD, I mean when Rome attacked Jerusalem under General Titus, they see much of that destruction of Jerusalem the way that we would see future end times like the tribulation. So in the case of the final judgment, they believe that it's still in the process of being fulfilled. Many full preterists believe that we're living in a form of the new heavens and the new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I get asked at times to watch things or read things or listen to things. And my general response, if it seems something worth reading or listening to or watching, is that I'm pretty far behind on everything I need to watch, read, and listen to. So I make no guarantee that if someone gives me a book that I'm going to read it in a certain amount of time or watch whatever it is in a certain amount of time. Well, this one gentleman contacts me, whom I'd never met before, and he's a full preterist, and he starts talking to me, and it just seems like online debates never go well, and there's no part of me that's remotely close to being a full preterist, and so he's pushing for me to read his book, and finally, get, I, I'm thinking this is not going to end well between us, he, and it gets to the point where he starts telling me that God is going to judge me for being a false teacher and not holding to, to full preterism. I mean, if, if you had to give me a list of things that I want to read, um, a book arguing for full preterism would, would not even be on that list unless I wanted to be able to be better equipped to argue with or debate with full preterists. And so, to me, because full preterists do not look forward to the second coming of Christ, because full preterists do not look forward to a resurrection of the dead, I would consider them heretics. They would not be in the realm of Orthodox Christianity. There are certain foundational truths that must be held to for people to be in that realm, and full preterists simply are not in that realm. Now, what's interesting is because partial preterists and full preterists have this, a very similar sounding title, you would assume that they're very close together because they're both preterists, but there's actually a world of difference between the two. There's so much difference that again, partial preterists are within the realm of Orthodox Christianity, but I would say full preterists are, in fact, heretics. Now, as you might expect, as I was looking for the names of any respected individuals who were re also recognizable or denominations that are full preterists, I couldn't find any. So I could not find one respected recognizable individual who's a full preterist, and I, the only denominations, if they're, if they're even considered that, I'm not even sure if there are any denominations that are full preterists, I could not find any. Now go ahead and turn to Revelation 1. And look, we'll look at verse 1 together. And, and I, while you turn there, I'll just tell you there's some if you go verse by verse through scripture, you can be confident that you're going to hit the things God wants you to hit. It was a blessing for me to come to these verses about the second coming of Christ because I haven't preached on that topic much. But there's some verses that have considerable application, and then there are some verses that don't have as much application. Well, what's the application for these verses? Besides being equipped to look forward to the second coming of Christ, my hope is the application would be that we would long to see Christ. That, that we would long for the blessed hope, the glory of his return. Now, in verse 1 Revelation of Revelation 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things... Now, notice this. So, God gave the revelation of Jesus Christ to John to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Notice that. The things that must soon take place, and I cannot tell you how much contention has arisen over that phrase that Revelation is a book of things that must soon take place. Now, who's going to cling to that? Preterists are. Well, preterists cling to these words, and they date the writing. Now, if you remember, I said a significant date in church history is 70 AD when Rome attacked Jerusalem. 
Well, if you're going to say that the book of Revelation is describing events that occurred in 70 AD, then when must you say that the book of Revelation was written, or when must you say the book of Revelation was written before? You must say that the book of Revelation was written before 70 AD. So a major point of argument among preterists and most other scholars is an early dating of Revelation. They must take Revelation and say that John wrote it prior to 70 AD so that it could be describing events that were going to occur in 70 AD. It goes outside the scope of the sermon, but there's considerable evidence. In fact, aside from preterists, I don't know of anyone who argues for an early dating of, seven, of, of the book of Revelation. There's considerable evidence to support the book of Revelation being written in the last decade of the first century, around 95 AD, near the end of Emperor Domitian's reign, 81 to 96, and well after Rome attacked Jerusalem. There's just, I almost kind of feel like there's too many things that I want to teach in Sunday school, to be honest with you. And one of the things that I feel like I could teach it in a future point in Sunday school would just be why, what this strong evidence is that Revelation was written around 95, 96 AD after Rome had attacked Jerusalem. But then even if we give a late dating for the book of Revelation, how do we explain this verse saying that the events in this book must soon take place? Well, it relates to the word soon. It's the Greek word tahos, tahos, but it's spelled T-A-C-H-O-S. The word for soon is spelled T-A-C-H-O-S. It's related to our word tachometer, and it means quickness or speed or swiftly. So I'll tell you two other places that this word tahas is used. So Acts 12, 7, an angel struck Peter on the side and woke him. This is when the angel's delivering him from prison. And he says, get up quickly. And then the chains fell off Peter. When the angel says, get up quickly, he didn't mean get up soon. He said, get up tahas, quickly, swiftly. Acts 22, 18, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, tahas. So this word in Revelation 1-1, it means quickly or swiftly. The events in this book must quickly or swiftly or speedily take place. There is another word used to refer to something happening not quickly but in the near future. Look in verse 3, Revelation 1-3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, this word is closer to our word soon. The Greek word for near is engus, engus, but this is not the word used in verse 1 for the events in Revelation happening quickly. And so, to be clear, Revelation 1.1, when it says that these events will soon take place, it would better be understood as these events will quickly take place, suddenly take place. So, it's not referring to when Jesus will return, soon after John wrote this, it's referring to how Jesus will return quickly, swiftly. In fact, the New King James has an asterisk that says that the word soon can be translated as quickly or swiftly. The, not as popular of a Bible, but I still think it's a good one. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says what must quickly or speedily take place. And, and it falls in line with what we're reading in Luke 17 and plenty of other places in the New Testament that describe Jesus coming as what in the night? A thief. Again, we're talk a thief doesn't break in slowly, right? You don't sit there and say, I think that's a, th a thief breaking in. He's moving very slowly as he picks the lock or tries to get through the windows. All of this agrees with the very quickness or suddenness of Christ's return. Turn a few chapters to the right to Revelation 3. And this brings us to the next part of lesson one. Like lightning, the second coming of Christ will be part two quick. So the next part of lesson one, like lightning, the second coming of Christ will be part two quick. Christ will come quickly. It will be a quick coming. A few chapters to the right, Revelate. Oh, and, and I guess to be clear, I don't know if I, I might not have made this clear, but full preterists, you say, so they think Christ's second coming occurred at 70 AD or in the past? You, you're telling me that full preterists believe Christ's second coming has already occurred? Yes, that's what they believe. 
but they don't they don't believe he returned physically they believe he returned spiritually so full preterists do not believe in a physical bodily return of christ that is visible flashing across the sky like lightning or in the language of acts 1 11, returning the way that he ascended instead they believe that jesus already returned and it was a spiritual coming versus a physical bodily coming i mean i've sat i even sat with someone someone used to go to this church and we're ha- and i'm talking to this person and i'm bringing him to acts one i'm bringing him to verses to like luke 17 and i'm saying it's overwhelmingly clear that when christ returns it is physical bodily visible to the whole world and this individual was arguing no it's a spiritual return it has already occurred not looking forward to a second coming of second coming as we do in revelation 3 11, jesus says i'm coming soon and again this is tahas he's saying i'm coming quickly hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown finally turn to revelation 22 6. and one of the other things is i i hope that this might alleviate some of the questions you have let's say you're reading through revelation your daily bible reading you're, you've finally gotten to the end of the book and then you reach revelation 3 11 and jesus says i'm coming soon could that be troubling to you if jesus hasn't returned yet and you say well why would this say that jesus is returning soon when he hasn't returned yet even with the late dating of 95 or 96 a.d it's been 2000 years well one argument is that for the lord a day is as so it's been two days i mean that's one argument but the other argument is he's not saying he's returning in the very new future now the other side of this is it seems to me that the entire new testament is written in such a way that everyone it's called the imminent return of christ when we talk about imminency we just mean nothing has to precede it there's nothing that has to take place first and the entire new testament is written in such a way that everyone would live believing that they could be the last generation everyone is to live in such a way that they believe christ can come during their lifetime and so the new testament maintains that while saying jesus will come quickly now in revelation 22 6 he said to me the words are trustworthy and true and the lord the god of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must here it is what must tahas soon take place and so the angel told john that the events in revelation would quickly take place and this is largely referring to the judgments in revelation 6 through 19 which roll out quickly there's the seal judgment judgments which open to the trumpet judgments and then the bull judgments they all roll out very sequentially but they all roll out very quickly there's no way to be preparing for these judgments they're quickly unleashed and similarly when jesus returns he returns quickly like lightning striking people will not have time to prepare now turn back to luke 17 25. luke 17 25. and while you turn there i'll share something else i'm not sure i'm convinced that it's a sign of humility for people to say that they're like pan tribs or however it pans out the reason that i don't like that is we have a responsibility to learn god's word the best we can it is not enough to simply say well you know what i don't know there's arguments or disagreements about this we must dig into god's word and attempt to understand one of the most significant events that will ever occur perhaps only second to christ's first coming is his second coming it is not enough to just be ignorant or oblivious about it and so we can have some questions but hopefully they would be questions we have after striving to learn and understand these things for ourselves now in luke 17 25 jesus says first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation every translation i could find says must suffer he must suffer versus should suffer or will suffer now why do you think this verse says jesus must suffer 
versus will suffer or should suffer because it's God's sovereign plan for your salvation he must suffer for you to be saved it he must suffer and take the punishment that your sins deserve otherwise there's no hope whatsoever for humanity it was God's sovereign plan so he could redeem sinful man and so for that reason it's not that he should suffer or will suffer it's that he must suffer or we're hopeless we have no savior without him suffering so Jesus is telling the disciples about the glory of his second coming but he doesn't want them to get the order of events wrong so in other words when I tell you that Jesus is telling the disciples about the order of events or about the glory of his second coming he wants them to understand what's going to precede the glory and what is going to precede the glory suffering that is the order of events which he wants to make sure they get correct that it is suffering and then glory Luke 14 26 was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter his glory the suffering and that's generally the case for us too when do you receive your glory before or after the suffering <laughs> you'll be glorified after the suffering it's not glory and then suffering it's suffering for Christ picking up your cross daily and then glory later at least three separate recorded instances just in Luke's gospel of Jesus telling the disciples that he would suffer and then be rejected but they never understood now after telling them about his suffering Jesus moves back to talking about his second coming by using two of the most familiar accounts of judgment in all of scripture so Jesus wants to associate his second coming with two of the most familiar accounts of judgment in all of scripture and look with me at the first account in verse 26 just as it was in the days of Noah so will it be in the days of the Son of Man which is just another way to refer to Jesus's second coming so Jesus says that when he returns it will be like the days of Noah now when I think about the days of Noah or I want to describe the days of Noah what are some words that come to mind <laughs> if I want to describe the world or the days of Noah what, what are some words that come to mind oh yeah wicked evil depraved lawless sinful the verse that comes to mind Genesis 6 5 the Lord saw the wickedness of man was on the earth every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually so even though all of us as a group are going to agree that when we think about the days of Noah we think about wickedness and evil Jesus discusses Noah's day and he doesn't mention wickedness look what he describes the people doing instead in verse 27 they're eating drinking marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all now just be honest does verse 27 sound very wicked no it doesn't it almost can sound more ordinary hold on to this we're building up to a point some of the most basic and common behaviors eating and drinking not referring to alcohol marrying and being given in marriage so it's almost like Jesus is trying to make the people sound not bad look at the second illustration verse 28 likewise just as it was in the days of Lot now in the days of Lot so our minds go to Sodom again I'm not going to ask you you're going to say the same thing I say what are the days of Lot like you're going to say wicked evil depraved but look what he says they're doing in the days of Lot they're eating and drinking they're buying and selling they're planting and building and Jesus says when he returns it's going to be like these days now I don't know if anything in all of Scripture can make us think of wickedness as much as Sodom I mean Sodom has become a metaphor for wickedness we want to describe wicked places we call them Sodom but when Jesus mentions the activities the people in Sodom are engaging in he doesn't mention anything wicked again it's very moral eating and drinking buying and selling he says planting and building you can probably guess and I'm not joking why when he talks about Sodom he doesn't talk about marriage and being given in marriage right because Sodom had no regard for marriage but there's also no mention of homosexuality or any of the sinful acts that got Sodom destroyed in fact we would not even know Jesus was talking about a wicked place if not for the mention of Lot but sure enough he's talking about a wicked place because look what happens in verse 29 on the day when Lot went out from Sodom fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all so the judgment came so swiftly in Lot's day just like in Noah's day 
People were in the middle of their ordinary everyday activities and then sulfur and fire comes down from heaven and destroys them without any opportunity for them to escape. And then look at verse 30, Jesus says, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So he makes it perfectly clear that this is all about his second coming. So why did Jesus mention these places, places notoriously wicked, associate them with his second coming and not mention their wickedness? And the answer is, he's not emphasizing their wickedness. He's emphasizing how unexpectedly the judgment came, that the people were so unprepared, they were in the middle of eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting and building, marrying and being given in marriage. And this brings us to the last part of lesson one. Like lightning, the second coming of Christ will be part three, unexpected. The people in Noah's day and in Lot's day were completely unprepared when the judgment came, doing everything people would normally be doing. Now, here's my suspicion. I can't say for sure this is the case, but I think Jesus wants to talk about these days, and he wants us to be able to relate, so he makes them sound like our days and our activities, eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, buying, selling, planting, building nothing wrong inherently with any of these activities the problem was the people were so absorbed in their everyday lives that they were completely unsuspecting when the judgment came so the problem was not the physical earthly things they were doing the problem was that they had no concern for anything spiritual or heavenly and it just makes me want to think what are you so absorbed in what are you so consumed with when you wake up are your thoughts entirely on physical earthly matters or are you thinking of heavenly spiritual matters? Are you, are you so focused? Because here's, here's what it is. We kind of think, well, if I'm not doing bad things, I'm okay. It's not enough to just not do bad things. We must be heavenly or spiritually minded. It can't just be, well, I'm not doing these bad things. It must also be, what does Christ want me doing? So I can be doing those things when he returns. People in our day will be completely preoccupied with earthly affairs, not even immoral ones, when Jesus returns. But as a result, even engaged in their amoral or moral activities, they are still totally unsuspecting. And this is why most of Jesus' parables about his second coming present him returning unsuspect, unexpectedly and surprising people. I'll just use Matthew's gospel. Go ahead and turn to Matthew 24. We will not turn back to Luke's gospel. I'm going to go through these verses quickly because I just want you to be able to catch this theme. Jesus preaches so many parables about his second coming, and they share the theme of people being surprised, of his return being unexpected. So in Matthew 24... Jesus tells a parable about a thief who breaks into a man's home unexpectedly. Look at verse 43. Matthew 24, 43. Know this, if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and he would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you don't expect. He's coming unexpectedly. Don't let him catch you unprepared. Right after this, Jesus tells the parable of a servant who did not expect his master to return. Look at verse 50. Matthew 24, 50, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he doesn't know, and then notice this, verse 51, he'll cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, pretty serious punishment for just being surprised by your master, being cut in pieces and put with the hypocrites so the idea isn't that he's being punished because he was unprepared for his master's return. The idea is he's cut in pieces because he's an unbeliever who had no concern whatsoever for his master's return. We're not saved by being concerned about Christ's second coming, but if we are saved, we have concern for Christ's second coming. If we can live completely oblivious with no thought whatsoever to Christ's return, it's very hard to reconcile that with a regenerate life. Matthew 25, look in Matthew 25, the next chapter, Jesus tells the parable of the ten virgins. Five are foolish, were not prepared when the bridegroom arrived. Verse 10, 
Matthew 25, 10, while the foolish virgins are going to buy oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. All about Jesus coming unexpectedly, encouraging us to be ready. Outside of the Gospels, the rest of the New Testament, so many verses I could give you just on this topic of Jesus coming unexpectedly. He compares himself to a thief. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You're not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. 2 Peter 3, 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Revelation 3, 3, I come like a thief. You will not know at what hour I come against you. Revelation 16, 15, behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. Now, you might be quick to say, well, of all the things that Jesus could compare himself with, why a thief? That's not what he's doing. He is not comparing himself with a thief. He's comparing himself or his second coming with the way that a thief breaks in. He compares the way he will return with the way that a thief robs you. A thief does not announce his arrival. He comes when it is unexpected, and the same is true with Jesus, and the only way to be on guard against a thief is to live in constant readiness. The only way to be prepared for Jesus' return is to live in constant readiness. So we need to ask ourselves, do I want Jesus to return and find me, fill in the blank, watching this, talking this way, acting this way, looking this way, living this way, do I want Jesus to return, my master and Lord, who has redeemed me and owns my life, and find me as his servant doing this, talking this way, living this way, looking this way? And this brings us to lesson three. Jesus' first coming was for salvation, and his second coming is for judgment. Jesus' first coming was for salvation, and his second coming is for judgment. Okay, now when I ask you a question, I often tell you it's not a trick question, but this time it's a trick question, okay? <laughs> so here comes the trick question. Was the flood an account of salvation or judgment? <laughs> the flood is an account of salvation and judgment for sure. Listen to this verse. From this morning, for the salvation and judgment just in this verse that we studied in the sermon, Luke 17, 27, they're eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. You can hear the salvation and the judgment. Noah entered the ark. It was salvation for eight souls. Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives. Judgment, the flood came, destroyed them all for the rest of the world. You know, it could have been salvation for a lot more people. 2 Peter 2, 5 tells us, do you know what Noah was? I mean, Enoch was the first, unless I'm missing something. You kind of think, oh, the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they're prophets before them. Seems like the first prophet was Enoch. And we know Noah was a prophet too, because 2 Peter 2, 5 tells us he was a preacher or herald of righteousness. He was prophesying, preaching to people about the coming judgment, and nobody listened except his son. So there could have been a lot more than eight people that got on that ark but nobody cared. They're too busy with their lives, eating, drinking, building, planting, giving in marriage, being married. What about Sodom? Another trick question. Was Sodom an account of salvation or judgment? It was salvation for Lot and his family, at least his family that didn't look back, right? We'll talk more about that in next week's sermon. His, his wife was saved out of Sodom, but definitely not saved completely. A judgment for the rest of the world. So often this is the case. Salvation and judgment mixed together. Canaan, you think about the strongest instances of judgment in all of Scripture. The extermination of the Canaanites. Was it salvation or judgment? It was both. Who was it salvation for? There was salvation. Who? Rahab. The Gibeonites experienced salvation. They, the Gibeonites might have went about it the wrong way. They sure did. They deceived, I think it's Joshua 8, they deceived the nation into believing that they had come from a far west. But do you know why they did that? They deceived for the same reason Rahab deceived. It was wrong to deceive, but it was sure done for a good reason. 
because they feared God and they wanted to be on God's side. Rahab and the Gibeonites, they might have went about it the wrong way, but they wanted to be on God's side. And they ended up being on God's side, and they were saved. The Amalekites, probably one, one of the other strong examples of judgment and salvation. Saul is commanded to exterminate the Amalekites. It, it seems horrible. You don't even want to read about it. Salvation for the Kenites. 1 Samuel 15, 6, Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites or else I'll destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from the Amalekites. They were saved before the Amalekites were judged. And people love to focus on salvation. I like to focus on salvation, but we're doing something wrong if we focus on salvation without also recognizing judgment. Listen to this. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that our beliefs in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The very next verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And people love to quote this verse as though there is no judgment or condemnation. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. What is that talking about? His first coming. God did not send his son into the world the first time to condemn the world. Another verse making the same point, John 12, 47, if anyone hears my words and does, does not keep them, I do not judge. Listen to this. Listen, can you imagine how deceived you can become if you, don't, if you take this verse in isolation? If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. How does Jesus sound? Jesus like, it sounds like Jesus... He has no problem if everyone disobeys him, everyone rejects him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Entirely first coming. In Jesus' second coming, he does not come into the world to save. He comes to judge. He does not come as Savior. He comes as judge. And there's this incredible duality with Christ. I mean, it's almost unfathomable. It's almost hard to wrap your mind around the duality of Christ. It's difficult to harmonize. In his first coming, he's the lamb slain for the sins of the world. In the second coming, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah to devour his enemies. I was talking to my children the other night during one of our studies about the idol that we frequently create. And you might not even know you create this idol. But you create the idol when you focus on some of God's attributes to the exclusion of others. Now, my suspicion is rare is the person who doesn't focus on God's love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, or rare is the person who doesn't love the lamb. But if you love the lamb and you focus on the love, mercy, grace, forgiveness, and you deny or you ignore the lion, you deny the second coming, you deny the wrath, the anger, the justice. What have you created? You have your own idol. He might look more like the God of the Bible than the Muslim God, but it's still an idol nonetheless. Now, let me conclude with this. We don't want to be taken by surprise. Even if Jesus is not returning next week, next month, next year, or perhaps even in our lifetimes, we should be living like he is because here's the thing. Regardless of when Jesus returns, are we going to meet him? Even if he doesn't return in our lifetimes, it could be during our lifetimes, and if not then, it will be the day of our deaths, but we will face Christ someday. So we should live in light of that reality that we will meet him, we want to be ready, and living like we can meet him at any moment is the only way to do so. If you have any questions or I can pray for you in any way, I'll be up front after service and I'd consider it a privilege to speak with you. Father, I thank you so much for your word, the great encouragement it gives us to look forward to the blessed hope, the glory of your second coming, something in my own life I don't think about or focus on enough. And so help us to live in light of that reality. Father, I do pray that you would give us a heavenly and eternal perspective. We can become so absorbed in our earthly affairs, the buying, selling, planting, building, giving in marriage and being marriage, all, all generally moral things, things we'd consider good, Lord, but if we become preoccupied with them, then there's something wrong, Lord. So convict us, help us to keep our attention on you. 
to be ready to stand before you and meet you, whether at your second coming or the day of our deaths. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.